It can't rain all the time. Unless you're trying to remake this movie. So The Crow tells the story of a murdered musician who comes back to life to avenge the deaths of him and his fiance. What is going on guys? Well, it's not quite Devil's Night, uh, but we're going to call this Devil's Week because we're going to be talking about The Crow all week long. There are four films in this franchise, so I'm going to be doing all four of them as a standalone review and then doing a ranking after that. Uh, this is a, this one specifically is a review that I have owed a patron for a little over a year now, so I'm glad to finally do this for Joseph Jones. Joseph, you're the man. He's always on Twitch, uh, always hanging out whenever I'm playing Far Cry, stuff like that. So Joseph is a really good supporter of mine, and I'm um, glad that you picked an awesome movie for your Patreon request. Uh, speaking of Patreon requests, it's not necessarily something that I do anymore. I do have a backlog of a couple more requests I need to get to, but there is a lot of other perks and exclusive content that I give to my patrons. I just did my top 10 Halloween moments just a couple days ago, and I have a Patreon companion video for that with even more Halloween moments. So I'm going to start doing a lot more stuff exclusive to Patreon. If you want to jump on that train or if you just want to support this channel, please check out that Patreon link in the video description below, and I appreciate you guys considering that. Now, as far as The Crow, this is a movie that... I was a little bit late to the party on, I'll be honest with you. I didn't watch this movie until I was in my 20s. I don't really know why. I don't know if it's a movie that I just didn't have access to for a long time or never really heard much of a fan base for it until I joined uh, very actively the horror community online and everybody was talking about how awesome this movie was. So I finally checked it out in my 20s and instantly fell in love with it. And to be honest with you, I have never had the heart to watch any of the sequels because I really love this movie so much that I never wanted to stain what I saw The Crow as by these sequels that pretty much seems like everybody hates. So Crow 2, 3, and 4 are all going to be first time watches for me. But as far as this original film, The Crow, it's always one that's a little bit bittersweet to watch for obvious reasons. Uh, and if you don't know the obvious reason, I will certainly get into it a little bit in this video. But for such a early 90s comic book film, and a lot of people don't know, this is a comic book film, it still holds up very well decades later, which is more than you can say for most movies in the 90s, let alone comic book movies. So starting off with the positives about what I love that The Crow brings is that for a typical, you know, revenge tale, this movie and this story is such a unique take on that, uh, you could almost call it a tired subgenre. I mean, it's one of my favorite subgenres, but we've got them, every couple years we get a new one where somebody's wrong, you know, somebody's family was killed and they've got to go and kick ass to avenge them. We've seen it a dozen different ways just in the past couple of years. The Crow is one of those movies that really does stand out in that subgenre because of how much style, how much atmosphere, and just how much coolness this movie has. I mean, just from the look of it, from the darkness of it, from that comic book aesthetic that they definitely translate to film in a time where that was not necessarily the popular thing to do because most of them sucked ass. Uh, the Crow brings what could have been a very run of the mills, guy comes back to avenge death uh, storyline and just makes it this really iconic place and time in the early 90s that they have never been able to replicate. They have never been able to replicate it with the sequels from what I've heard. And this movie has gone through, I think maybe a dozen or more different iterations of trying to get a remake and they just can't get it off the ground because whatever the hell was going on, whatever juices were flowing back in 1994, they got it right and they have not gotten it right since. One of the main things that they got right is the casting of Brandon Lee. Now, admittedly, I'm a little bit ignorant to his career before The Crow. This is really the only movie that I've seen from him. And it shows how great his performance is and how much he embodies this character that this is the only time I've seen Brandon Lee's work. And even just that being true, I see the untapped potential that this guy had and just a superstar that was literally on the verge of being one of those A-list actors in the 90s and then was tragically taken from all of us uh, way too soon. So that, that's the bittersweet element to this movie that every time you watch it, it's always at least a little bit of you is choked up watching it because of how great that he is in this role and how great he was as an actor. So for those that don't know, Brandon Lee was accidentally killed uh, right at the end of production during the shoot of this movie where a prop gun accidentally had something lodged inside of it and uh, the proper precautions were not taken and a dummy bullet became a actual bullet. 
and it hit him in the abdomen and he died in the hospital and uh, they had to refigure this movie and finish it without him and he was just taken way too soon you know this is a guy that uh, if you were alive in the 90s he was certainly a name that was rising and the crow was going to be one of those movies very very eerily similar to how Heath Ledger who certainly was a star and certainly was uh, very respected in Hollywood but when the Dark Knight came out that was going to be the movie that was just going to catapult him into superstardom and kind of the same eeriness of being taken away too soon and Brandon Lee was uh, a story that I have heard numerous times throughout uh, the, my entire life because that's the main story that's the most uh, the biggest example of stunts gone wrong on a movie set it's the most famous one and unfortunately just a couple of days ago and scarily enough it was the day that i actually rewatched the crow we had the same thing happen on a set of alec baldwin's movie where a director of photography got shot by a prop gun that went wrong so it's unbelievable that even decades later Hollywood is still obviously not taking the proper precautions when it comes to using firearms on a set. I mean, how many times does somebody have to die on the set of a movie needlessly for the proper precautions to be taken? It's amazing. But Brandon Lee is certainly the heartbeat of this movie. He continues to be the heartbeat of this movie. He's one of the main reasons why they can never get it right after that. I mean, you can say what you will about the directing and about the, the story quality and kind of diminishing returns of this revenge tale, but without somebody that just has that it factor like Brandon Lee had playing Eric Draven, the movie just crumbles without him. And I think that, you know, somehow, like almost supernaturally, there's some kind of a curse on this movie to where, you know, there, there's stories that you can read where there was other actors that were just feeling off about the safety precautions on this set and was feeling like this looming threat, like something was gonna go wrong before Brandon Lee was tragically shot. And even decades later, like as many times as they have tried to remake this movie, it something always stops them. Something always throws a monkey wrench into the system. And for as many movies that we have seen remade and put zero effort and zero fucks given into it, like they can just churn it out in a weekend just for that name recognition, the Crow is the only one that I have ever seen multiple directors, multiple big name stars attached to play Eric Draven, and it just never comes to fruition. And I have a sneaking suspicion that it might never come to fruition. There's just something about that tragedy of Brandon Lee that just makes this movie a snapshot in time that almost should never be messed with again. This should be the only time, the only one. But moving on beyond all of that, uh, Brandon Lee, as far as his performance, I mean, he's got the physicality down. I mean, you're talking about the son of Bruce Lee here. Uh, he has that charm factor to him to where he's supposed to be this dark, uh, kind of foreboding presence in the movie, and he certainly is, but he has personality to him when he's interacting with Ernie Hudson, when he's interacting with the young girl, Sarah, and even when he's toying with, you know, the people who are gonna become his victims. <laughs> That's my favorite part of his personality and his, his performance is where he's really just relishing in the fact that he's now invincible. So no matter what they do, he is going to bring death to them tonight on Devil's Night. Try hard. Try again. <laughs> Victims, aren't we all? And he just brings all of that forth in his performance. I mean, the look is fucking awesome. If I was my age back in 1994 when this movie came out, I would have instantly been the crow that Halloween and probably every other dude that saw this movie was the crow that year for Halloween. I mean, even just revisiting this movie, if I would have had more prep time, I would have done the makeup and bought a black trench coat just to do this review. It's just such an awesome, iconic look. Uh, everything about Eric Draven and what Brandon Lee brings to this character just makes this movie how great that it is. But I gotta be honest, aside from Brandon Lee, I think that Ernie Hudson brings a lot of heart to this movie too. You know, he's one of the few kind of shines of light in this very, very dark world and this very dark storyline to where him being this warm presence that, you know, is still kind of a little bit messed up from what happened to Eric Draven and his fiance because he was the one that was in the hospital with her and you know he always he's one of those cops that you can tell 
wants to be a cop because he wants to help people. And he has this relationship with Sarah. And even when he comes across Eric Draven, now that he has been you know, resurrected and he is killing and blowing things up all around the city, he eventually comes around to him and kind of becomes his, uh, his sidekick to a certain extent by the third act of the film. And I just think Ernie Hudson brings a lot of charm to that role. You know, it's the one gleam of light in this story and it's so necessary. They could have very easily done it a little bit too much and relished in the darkness a little bit too much to where the movie would lose some rewatchability. I think Ernie Hudson brings that balance and he brings it well. I really enjoy that all of the revenge scenes, all of the kills, if you will, in this movie are all unique. And for the most part, with the exception of maybe one, they all kind of fit the theme of the villain to where, you know, the knife guy turns into a pincushion, gets all of his knife stuck in him. You got the guy that's uh, turning Sarah's mom into a dope fiend. He gets a whole bunch of uh, heroin needles or morphine needles um, injected into his chest. And you, Eric Draven just goes along the way and every single person that he comes across never gets the same treatment. And it makes the movie go at a really nice pace to where it doesn't feel like it's kind of boring. You know, if you're there for any kind of carnage, it's not necessarily a gory movie. It's certainly subdued in that. It's more action, but it's entertaining because they always change it up. You get the stabs, you get explosions, you get gunfights. I mean, you get sword fights by the end of it. There's a lot of variety in the kills and in all of the action sequences to where the whole movie is just so rewatchable and, and so entertaining because it never feels like it gets bored with itself. And so you never get bored watching it. And finally, this does have a pretty damn good soundtrack for the era that it came out. I mean, you've got Soundgarden, you've got some of that grunge. There's also some metal in there. It's a really good soundtrack. This came out the same year as movies like Pulp Fiction, which is another iconic soundtrack from the 90s. So I've always heard people almost talk about the soundtrack to this movie as much as I've heard people talk about the movie. It's just one of those synergies to where the music was just such a product of its time and fit the era and fit the style and the tone of this movie so well that it almost has a legacy all on its own. Moving on to the mixed aspects, I have two, one of which is the easy shot to take of this movie is that some of the CGI does not age very well. Some of it ages pretty damn good, especially the stuff that they had to use to finish this film in Brandon Lee's absence to where they had to impose his face onto stunt actors in one or two shots. There's a part where he walks into a room that's taken from a previous part of the film that he already shot. So that stuff is seamless. If I didn't tell you the tragedy regarding Brandon Lee and somehow you had never heard it before, they did a really damn good job to where you watch this movie and it's not obvious. I mean, it's not like a Furious 7 to where it's impossible to watch the movie and not figure that out by the end of it. But there's aspects to this early CGI that they were really just now kind of starting to figure out somewhat in the early 90s, namely the scenes where you have somebody falling and it's just a digital shot of somebody like this across a green screen background that really looks vintage 90s, early CGI, and a couple others as well, but luckily the movie doesn't use a ton of those shots. A lot of it's practical, a lot of it's gunplay and explosions and fist fights and things that really didn't need CGI back then, but there are moments that certainly are going to continue to age a little poorly. And the other element that I mixed on is the villains here. Now, I think that some of the actors here perform much better than others. I mean, you've got David Patrick Kelly, who we all know and love from the Warriors and Commando, you know, remember I said I was going to kill you last, Sully? I lied. That guy, he is awesome in every movie that he is in. He just brings it. Even if it's a movie that doesn't require some huge theatrical performance, he's always given it his all. I think he's the standout villain here. I know you. You, I knew, I knew you. But you ain't you. You can't be you. We put you through the window. There ain't no coming back. But there's some others that I think are, are almost too over the top. Now, this is the tone of the movie to a certain extent, and it can certainly handle over the top characters with this crazy premise. So it's not like they derail the movie, or it's not even really like it's a big problem. It's just something that I feel like the villains could have been a little bit more intimidating here and there, and a little bit less comic booky, if that even makes sense. I mean, they're just very, uh, they're chewing up the scenery a lot of the times when I feel like you could have gone for another tone and they would have been a little bit more effective as these characters that are supposed to be the most despicable human beings as far as we are to understand to where you know full on from the beginning of the movie what they have done to Eric Draven and to his fiance and you want them to pay. So when they're really having fun with it and just joking around and fire it up, fire it up every five minutes, 
It's a little much. I mean, even Michael Wincott, this guy is iconic for his voice alone. I remember playing Darksiders 2 and it took me like the first hour of the game. I'm like, why the fuck do I know this guy's voice? That's Wincott, that's who it is. He's an actor that every time he shows up, you always enjoy seeing him, but even his character, I mean, he's the big bad here. He is the head of the snake. And there's aspects to him that's really dark and fucked up and disturbing, and there's others that's just kind of over the top to where he's not a believable character to me. So, I don't know. I like them. I certainly am not shitting on the villains. I just think in hindsight, there could have been a little bit more iconic than what they're presented as here. And my one negative of the movie is that I think that the child actor that played Sarah, her performance really does not age all that well. It's not terrible. I've certainly seen a lot worse. And of course, you know, kid actors, you, you want to take it a little bit easier on them because they're kid actors. You know, they're not out there to win Oscars and stuff like that. But she's the one performance in this movie that really stands out is just not really bringing it. She just kind of seems monotone for all the crazy situations that she's in to where her best friends have been, you know, murdered and she's on the street because her mother's a dope fiend and now one of her friend is undead and killing people and she gets kidnapped at one point. Like all this crazy shit going on and you never really feel her emotions kind of, the needle never really moves with this character. I mean, even down to small things that annoy me. I mean, I'm somebody that grew up in the Midwest, and when it shows her trying to eat that hot dog, and she's like, mm, no, ah, I'm like, God, you can't even act about how to eat a hot dog? Come on, Sarah, come on. And you know what? For my one nitpick of this movie being the performance of a child actor, if that's all negative that I have to say about it, that says how pretty damn awesome The Crow is, right? So overall, guys, I think this is a damn good movie. It's a damn entertaining movie. It's aged very well. For somebody that loves revenge movies, revenge thrillers, revenge action films, this is certainly one of my favorites. And as much as I champion remakes and as much as I really do support the idea of remakes, as long as they do it for the right reasons, I do think this is one of those very, very few movies for me that should just be left alone. Uh, it's an iconic classic, and if you have not seen it, you definitely need to check it out. So if you like revenge action movies, definitely add this thing to your collection and put it on on Devil's Night and have a blast of a time. So go out and buy it. So what do you guys think of The Crow? Do you love this movie? Do you hate this movie? Do you actually prefer one of the sequels? Are any of the sequels going to be good? At least tell me that. Is any of them gonna be tolerable or is it just gonna be misery from here on out? Let me know guys. And is there another movie that Brandon Lee did that's as awesome as this one that I should check out? Because I'm definitely curious. Please let me know down below in the comments and we will talk about it. Please like and share this video, get some new eyes on it, get some new subscribers to the channel. And if you are watching me for the first time, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss the rest of this review series, including our ranking of 31 on 31 on October 31st, which is a big horror ranking that we do annually on this channel. You definitely don't wanna miss that. And I just did a whole shitload of Halloween content if you're a fan of that franchise. So definitely check out all of that stuff. Thank you guys for watching as always and remember, Opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.